our pastor in. Well, good evening, Hope Bible Church, Ottawa, Pastor Ray here. Love you so much, and my family and I, we're praying for you right now as you're gathered in Jesus' name and lifting up uh, the name of Jesus Christ and now getting ready to come under his word. Keep the fervency, loved ones, and press in to know the Lord right now. Yes, it's the summer, but man, the Lord has great things in store as we seek his face. Amen? All right, so keep that fervency. And right now, I have the privilege of introducing to you your guest preacher tonight. He's a dear, dear friend of of mine for a long time now. His name is Nathan Penny, and Nathan is the pastor of Soul Care Ministries at Hope Bible Church in Oakville, our planting church, and he and his wife Natasha are here. And so before Nathan comes up, why don't you do this? Two things. Open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4 and put your hands together to give him a warm Hope Ottawa welcome. All right. Well, great to be with you this evening. Before we get started, let's pray. Let's pray. So, Father, here we are. Here we are. And I pray for each one of us right now that we would lay our hearts before you. And as we have already prayed, search our hearts. God, again, we pray, search our hearts. Search our hearts. If there are things going on in our hearts that do not please you. Um, Lord, would you, would you help us tonight to see the things you want us to see, to walk in repentance and to walk in faith and to grow closer in our relationship and our walk with you. You are absolutely the best. There, there, there is none greater. There, there is no greater treasure. There is no greater joy or peace that we can have in our hearts and to walk with you, to truly know you. So if there's anything, if there's anything standing in the way of that fellowship, Lord, please, would you put it on the table tonight? And would you help us to repent and to believe in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles there, uh, please go ahead and open them up to Ephesians chapter 4. And if you're here and you do not have a Bible, we would love to get a Bible in your hand. So if you would like a Bible, if you could just raise your hand, just slip your hand up, one of our ushers will get a Bible in your hand. And if you don't own a Bible, we would love for you to, to take that Bible home with you. Ephesians uh, chapter 4 verse 1 is where we will begin this evening. Now there's two things that we need to see from our text today. And here's, here's the first thing, that God has entrusted to you a very great power. God has entrusted to you a very great power. Here's the second thing, that God is calling us to use that power for good. So two things we need to see from our text tonight. God has entrusted us. He has entrusted you with a very, very great power. The second thing, that he's calling us to use that power for good. And here's why. Because it is literally the power of life and death. Literally. The power of life and death. You may be thinking, well, what is that power exactly? Well, here it is up on the screen, Proverbs 18. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. There are ways that we can speak death to people and tear them down. And there are ways that we can speak life to people and build them up. Our words are very, very important. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, in light of that, a study recently found that the average person speaks about 16,000 words per day. The average person, some way more, some way less. Okay? But the average person speaks about 16,000 words a day to other people. That's 16,000 times a day. You and I are impacting the lives of other people through the words that we speak. Maybe you're thinking, well, is that really such a big deal? I mean, does God really care about how I speak to people? Well, James put it this, he puts it this way up on the screen, James chapter 3. He says, no human being can tame the tongue. It's true, only God can do that. 
No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. That's what we just did. We just sang praises to God, right? With it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. In other words, God cares a lot about what we say to other people. God cares a lot about what we say to his image bearers. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So let's begin today by asking ourselves, am I being intentional about using words to build others up? Ask yourself, in my life, am I being intentional about using words to build others up? Think about this week. This week, were the people closest to you this week built up by your words? Were the people you're in closest relationship, were they this week built up by what you had to say to them? And we can also ask ourselves this. Are the people closest to me ever torn down by my words? Well, that leads us to our first point, which is this. I must stop tearing others down with corrupt words. I must stop tearing others down with corrupt words. Now, before we get into our text today, which is Ephesians 4, verse 29, we are going to first have a look at Ephesians 4, verse 1, because it sets the stage for verse 29. So Ephesians 4, verse 1, Paul says this. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. Like, literally, Paul is in chains. He is in prison in Rome for preaching the gospel. He's a prisoner for the Lord. So he says, I, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you. He's like, I'm pleading with you. I urge you to do something. What does he want them to do? He says, I urge you to walk. Walk refers to a lifestyle. He's like, I want you to live a certain way. I'm a prisoner. I'm pleading with you, live this way. What way? I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And what is that calling? It's this, holiness. In light of the gospel, the call upon the Christian life is a call then to holiness. And this verse, Ephesians 4, verse 1, is the turning point in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Because in chapters 1 through 3, Paul's been giving them amazing gospel truth, which is true for them, and it's also true for us as well. Such as, up on the screen, God chose us before he created the world. So before God spoke the world into existence, he chose you that you would be his. He chose you. Also this, God ordained that we would be holy and blameless before him. God is holy. No one can enter into the presence of God unless you are holy and blameless. And we are sinful. So how can we enter into the presence of God? Well, he made one way. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life and then to die on the cross to make absolute, full, complete, and utter payment for our sin so that we can be forgiven through faith in him. But not only that, he also lived the perfect life so that through faith in him, his righteousness can be credited to our account so that God can see us in Christ just as though we have, we have been perfectly obedient. so that now we can enter into the presence of God and he can see us as holy and blameless. Awesome. Next, God predestined us for adoption. So not only did he choose you, not only did he justify you so that you can be in his presence, but, but he has predestined you for adoption. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then you are a child of God. You are a child of the King. He has adopted you. He's also given us his Holy Spirit. So, so God is not just here and with us. God is also in us. God is in you. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. 
God also loves us perfectly. God's love is perfect and he has set his perfect love upon you. He couldn't love you any more than he does right now. And then this also, God has promised to show us the immeasurable riches of his grace. That one day when you and I step into glory, and that's just like right around the corner, really is. We step into glory, we will see, we will experience the immeasurable, can't measure it, grace of God, the riches of the immeasurable grace of God upon our lives. We'll see it, we'll experience it in a new way. Worship will just erupt from us in a whole new way. It'll make our greatest moment of worship in this life look like a drop in the ocean. These are some of the things Paul has been communicating to the Ephesians so far in chapters 1 through 3. But now, in chapter 4, he turns a corner and he says, in, in light of all of this, because all of this is true, in light of all this, because, because of who God is, because of what he's done for you in the gospel, because of what he's promised you for all of eternity, in light of all of this, because you believe this to be true, now go and live a life that is worthy. Go and live and pursue a life of holiness. Go and worship God with the way that you live, including with the way that you talk. Have a look now at verse 29. Verse 29. Paul says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. In other words, in light of the gospel, in light of who God is, what he's done for you, what he's promised you, in light of the gospel, worship God with the way that you talk by not letting any corrupting talk come out of your mouths. So what is corrupting talk? Well, corrupting talk, it's like a blanket term for any kind of speech that dishonors God. Any kind of speech that dishonors God. So this would include vulgar jokes. It would include crude language. And any speech that tears other people down, that's corrupting talk. And the word corrupting, it literally means rotten. Like you go to a garbage dump and what do you find there? You find rotten. Like milk that's three weeks past the expiry date, rotten. It's like that, that container in the back of the fridge that should have been thrown out three months ago. It's rotten, rotten. Now it's interesting that this word corrupting, which means rotten, it's used in the Bible in three different ways. It's used to describe rotten fish. It's used to describe rotten fruit. And now Paul uses it here to describe rotten words. So here's what he's saying. He's saying it like in the same way that if someone picked up a rotten apple and it's all moldy and it's soft and it's disgusting and they throw it at you and it hits you and it explodes all over you. In the same way, we can throw rotten words at people. But it doesn't hit them on the outside, does it? It hits them on the inside. It does far more damage. Therefore, Paul says, hey, in light of the gospel, in light of the gospel, worship God by no longer throwing rotten words at people. He says, worship God by no longer throwing rotten words, listen, at his image bearers. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Now, here's a question. Why would we ever do that? Like, like, why would we ever throw rotten words at someone? Why would we ever do that in the first place? Well, Jesus tells us why up on the screen. Luke chapter 6, Jesus says, For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. In other words, whatever is in the heart, it comes out of the mouth in the form of words. Whatever's in the heart, it comes out of the mouth in the form of words. So here's what we're learning right now. That corrupting talk comes from a corrupted heart. Corrupting words come from a corrupted heart. There's no bad smell coming out of the refrigerator unless there's first something rotten inside of it. Corrupted talk comes from a corrupted heart. We don't speak corrupting talk unless our hearts have first become corrupted. So how does that happen? How do our hearts become corrupted? Well, here's how up on the screen. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, the author says this. 
He warns us, he says, take care. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving, notice, heart. That is a corrupted heart. Evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened, notice, by the deceitfulness of sin. What corrupts the heart? Sin does. Sin corrupts the heart. The sin within us corrupts the heart. Now, if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you are no longer enslaved to that sin. Amen? We are no longer enslaved to sin. We have been broken free, uh, but, but it's still there. Sin is still present within us, and it is seeking to influence 24 hours a day the heart. And here's what I mean by that word heart up on the screen. The biblical heart is this. It refers to the mind, the affections, and the will. That's the biblical heart. The mind, the affections, and the will. Or we can think of it like this. The biblical heart is, is our thinking. It's the mind, it's our thinking. It's our desires. It's our affections. It's our emotions. That's all the heart. And then, and then it's also the will. It's the place where we do all of our choosing and decision-making. That's the biblical heart. So the heart is the place where we do all of our thinking. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, and he says, why do you think evil in your hearts? So the heart is the place we do all of our thinking. It's also the place where we have all of our desires and affections and treasuring and emotions. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the heart is the place where we have all our, our desires and affections. It's also the place of the will. It's the place where we make all of our choices and all of our decisions. It all flows out of the heart. Second Corinthians chapter 9, Paul's talking about giving. And he says that each one should give as he has decided in his heart. That's the biblical heart. It's the place where all of our thinking happens, all of our desiring and emotions, all of our choosing, all of it. It happens in the biblical heart. And this, this, the heart, is what gets corrupted by sin. And so how does that happen? How does sin corrupt the heart? Well, here's how up on the screen. Sin influences our thinking. Sin presses in on our thinking so that our focus becomes all about self instead of God. That's what sin does. It seeks to influence our, our thinking so we're focused on self instead of being focused on God. So our thinking is all about me, 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 self, self, self. Same with our, our, our affections. Sin presses in and seeks to influence our desires. So what we value most is not God, but self. Sin influences our desires, so we value self the most instead of God. Sin also influences the will. So that, so that our greatest commitment in life is not to God, but to self. This is what sin does. It seeks to make the heart all about self. It seeks to make our thinking all about self, our desires all about self, our will all about self. So the heart is all about self. And when the heart is all about self, here's what flows out of that heart up on the screen. Corrupted words. Corrupted words flow out of the heart that's all about self. And why is this the case? Here's why. Because sin has corrupted the heart. And now the heart is all about self. Thinking all about self. Desires all about self. Will all about self. And when the heart is all about self, then we start to think about other people, not as image bearers of God that we've been placed here to serve, but we start to think about other people as placed here to serve me. And then when they don't do what we want, we get angry. And that's when corrupted words, rotten words, words that hurt other people, words that discourage, words that tear other people down, begin to flow out of our hearts that are all about self. It's the parent who tears down their child with words because the child isn't doing what they want. It's the child who tears down their parent with words because the parent isn't doing what they want. It's the husband who tears down his wife with words because she's not doing what he wants. 
It's the wife who tears down her husband with words because he's not doing what she wants. It's the customer on the phone with the customer, rep, customer service rep who's tearing them down because they're not doing what they want. It's the driver who's tearing every bus down around them because no one's doing what they want. It's corrupted words flowing from corrupted hearts that are all about self. And because my heart is so often influenced by sin, and because my heart is so often all about self, I have said things to my wife that I deeply regret. There have been times when I've said things to my kids that I deeply regret. There have been times where I've said things to people that I I deeply regret. And in those moments, the reality was that my heart was all about me. And when I didn't get what I wanted, corrupt words came out of my mouth. And I think I'm probably safe to assume that I'm not the only one here who has experienced this. Is that true? Okay. So let me ask you, when is it for you that corrupting words are most likely to come out of your mouth? When, when, when is that? In what situation is that most likely to happen to you? And when it does happen, who is it that you're usually speaking to? Who is most often on the receiving end of your corrupted words? Ask yourself, is there anything that I need to confess to the Lord right now regarding my speech? Is there anything I need to confess to the Lord right now regarding my speech? Is there anyone that I need to ask forgiveness from today for the words that I have spoken to them? And here's another question. What are we supposed to do but our hearts? Because if our hearts don't change, if our hearts continue to be all about self, then corrupted words are just going to keep coming out of them. So how do our hearts change so that our words change? Well, here's how. Here's how our hearts change. Ready? It's by believing the gospel again and again and again and again, every day, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, believing again that Jesus Christ loves you so much that he went to the cross on your behalf, believing that he paid for all of your sins for your whole life, including all of your corrupted talk for your entire life, paid for in full, believing that he paid for it all through his suffering. This is how our hearts change. Let's have another look at Hebrews chapter three up on the screen because what we want is the opposite of this. We want the opposite. Look at, let's look at this again. The warning, take care brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. We want the opposite of that. Leading you to fall away from the living God. We want the opposite of that. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We want the opposite of this. We don't want to be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We don't want an evil, unbelieving heart that's leading us to fall away from the living God. We want a believing heart, a heart that's full of faith, that isn't leading us to fall away, but is leading us to cling to God. We want a believing heart leading us to cling to God. And this, loved ones, is what God uses to change our hearts from being all about self to being all about God. He uses believing, believing, believing who he is, believing what he's done for you in the gospel, believing what he's promised you. He uses believing because believing, genuine believing, makes our hearts all about God instead of all about self. Here's what I mean up on the screen. Believing, again, believing who God is, believing what he's done for us in the gospel, believing what he's promised us, believing. It influences our thinking so that our thinking is focused on God instead of being focused on self. 
Believing influences our desires. So we value God most instead of valuing self most. Believing influences our will so that our greatest commitment is to God instead of being, having our greatest commitment be to self. Believing makes the heart all about God instead of all about self. And out of that heart, out of a heart that's all about God, flows this up on the screen. Gracious words. Gracious words. That leads us to our second and final point, which is this. I must start building others up with gracious words. I must. I must. In light of the gospel, I must start building others up with gracious words. Have a look again at verse 29. Paul says this. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So in light of the gospel, not only are we to worship God by not saying certain things, we are also to worship God by saying certain things. And here's what we're supposed to speak. Gracious words. Words that give grace, words that strengthen others, words that encourage others and build others up. Now, is there anywhere in the Bible where we can see people doing this well? Well, here are two examples. First one on the screen, Onesiphorus. Ever heard of him? Onesiphorus. So this is what Paul said about Onesiphorus, okay? He said, may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me. It's the Apostle Paul. He's preaching the gospel. He's planting churches. He's counseling people from house to house. He's the refresher. He's refreshing people. But he himself is in great need of refreshment. So the Lord brings this guy, Onesiphorus, into Paul's life, not just one time, but many times. And Paul's like, that guy, when he came into my life, he often refreshed me. That guy was such a blessing to me. Question, would those you are closest to say that you are a refreshment to them? Those who you are closest to, when they see you coming, are they like, oh, here they come, here they come. They're so refreshing. Or how about this example, Barnabas up on the screen. Barnabas, Acts chapter four, says, thus Joseph who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. So there's this guy in the early church, his name's Joseph. And this guy is so encouraging to the early church, so so encouraging to the apostles themselves that the apostles are like, hey, come here, Joseph, come here, come here. Listen, we are changing your name. Like from now on, you are the son of encouragement. If encouragement had a son, it's you. Like that's where changing your, everyone call this guy the son of encouragement from now on. Like, imagine the the apostles are saying this to him. Question for us. Would the people that we interact with the most, would they call us encouraging? Again, when they see us coming, would they be like, here they come. They're so encouraging. Because listen, listen. Here's the truth. You and I are living in a time right now where so many people are so weighed down, so many people so very discouraged and in great need of encouragement. And I believe that God wants to use us, that he wants to use you and me to strengthen others and encourage others and build them up through the use of our words. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And one way, that we can use our words to give life. A great way we can do it is, is this. We can speak the word of God to each other. Now notice, notice in verse 29, Paul says this. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up. Now notice he says, as fits the occasion. So it's not one size fits all. He's like, as fits the occasion. Speak in a way that fits the occasion. So if we're going to speak the word of God to people in a way that fits the occasion, in a way that's relevant to what they're going through in their lives, that means that we're going to have to spend some time with people. It means that we're going to have to talk to people. 
It means we're going to have to do some listening and to try to understand what it, what it is that people are going through in their lives. And then we seek to try to discern, okay, so what does God's word have to say about what that person's going through right now? What, what, what truth from God's word would be most helpful for this person right now? Like, what could I share with them from the Bible that would be helpful and build them up? Is it a truth about who God is? Is it a truth about the gospel? Is it a truth about what God has promised? Is it a truth about what God has commanded? What can I share with them from the word that will be helpful to them right now? And this is a huge reason why all of us need to be reading our Bibles every day. I mean, yes, so that we can be blessed by our time with the Lord. Absolutely. But it's also so that we will have something to share with others and we can be a blessing to others and build them up. This is one practical way we can use words to build others up. We can share the word of God with them in a way that fits the occasion. But there is another very practical way that we can use words to build others up. Here it is. We can point out evidences of God's grace that we see in their lives. We can point out ways that we see God working in them, and we can point out ways that we see God working through them. And I'm not talking about flattery. I'm not talking about saying some things to someone because maybe they'll say something nice back. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about trying to build up someone's self-esteem and to try to tell them how awesome they are. It's not that either. What I'm talking about is being intentional about pointing out ways that we see God working in people and ways that we see God working through people. And there's actually a word for this. That word is affirmation. And it's called affirmation because we are affirming to people that we see God working in them and we see God working through them. Affirmation is describing what we see God doing in someone's life. So we might say something like, I, I, I see that God has given you courage to be bold for him. Or I see that God has given you self-control in that area. Or I see that God has given you this amazing work ethic that's such an encouragement to me. Or I see that God has blessed you with the gift of hospitality, how you're using that to bless other people. These are words that give life. These are words that bless, that give grace, that refresh people, that encourage them and build them up. These are the kinds of words that we need to speak. Because if any of us here resembles in any way Jesus Christ in our character at all, that is 100% the work of the Holy Spirit. And it glorifies God and it encourages others when we point to it. We point to it and we say to people, I see God working in you. I see him giving you, giving you such a heart to care for other people. Or I see that God has given you joy. Look at you. You have joy. You have joy in God. Or I see that God has given you supernatural peace in the midst of that storm that you're going through. Or I see that God has made you so kind. He's given you such a gentleness with people. And he's using that. I see that God has made you so faithful that you're using your gifts to bless others. These are words we need to speak. We need to. This is how Paul spoke all the time to the church. I mean, consider how he spoke to the Ephesians in, in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, up on the screen. Look what he says. He says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in all my prayers. Paul's like, I heard of your faith. I heard of your faith. I've heard of your love. I've heard of you. You're loving people. It's like, I'm so thankful. I never stop thanking God for you. I'm praying for you. Ask yourself, do we, do we talk this way? Am I doing this? Am I pointing out how I see God working in people? Am I pointing out how I'm seeing God work through people? Am I speaking words that give grace, that refresh, that encourage, that build up? Because listen, again, we are living in a time when people are literally starving for encouragement. Is that true? It is true. It is true. And God wants to use us to encourage them. And God wants to use them to encourage us. Amen? So let's get a little more personal. Ask yourself, 
am I doing this in my closest relationships? Husbands, wives, parents, friends, group members. Ask yourself, in my closest relationships, am I speaking words that give grace? Am I speaking words that refresh, that encourage, that build up? Am I doing this in my closest relationships? Or truth be told, do I tend to talk a lot more about how people need to do better and be different? Because if we're majoring on how people need to do better and be different, and we're minoring on, on speaking words that build up, there will for sure be a relational cost. In his book entitled Practicing Affirmation, Sam Crabtree uses the analogy of a bank up on the screen. Now, when you go to a bank, you're typically going to a bank to make a deposit or withdrawal, right? So let's say this bank, when you want to make a deposit, you can only deposit $100. And when you want to make a withdrawal, you can only withdraw $1,000, okay? So let's say you do five of each in a week. So you make five deposits. How much would that be? 500. You make five withdrawals. How much would that be? 5,000. Okay, so for our, our math people in the room, what would your balance be at the end of that week? 4, Minus 4,500, right? Minus 4,500. Even though you made the same number of deposits, same number of withdrawals, they've been for different amounts. So you're actually in the negative, right? Likewise, when we affirm someone, when we build them up, when we point out evidences of grace in their lives, every time we do that, it's like making a $100 deposit into the relational bank account. But every time we correct them, every time we tell them how they need to do better, every time we tell them how they need to be different, it's like, it's like making a $1,000 withdrawal from the relational bank account. And so if we give someone five affirmations in a week and we give someone five corrections, that sounds really balanced to us. It feels balanced because there's five of each, but we'll actually be in the relational red because corrections or words that people can sometimes find discouraging, these words tend to hold way more weight and are far more easily remembered than affirmations. True or false? It's true. It's true. So if we give someone the same number of affirmations as corrections, the relational account will be overdrawn. It's going to be overdrawn. And then we're going to be confused when that person says that they find us discouraging. Because all we can remember are all the positive things we've said, but what they tend to remember will be the things they've considered to be negative. And that's because the relational account is overdrawn. And when the relational account is overdrawn, here's what happens. Ears close. When the relational account is overdrawn, that person, that husband, that wife, that child that friend, that group member that we so badly want to communicate with is no longer listening. They have tuned us out. So it doesn't matter how valuable our counsel might be or how true it is or how much they need it. It's not being heard. We can think of it this way. There is nothing we can do that will ensure that our loved ones will listen to what we say. Nothing. Nothing. We, there's nothing we can do that will absolutely guarantee that our loved ones will listen to what we're saying. But there's something we can do that will pretty much ensure they won't. All we need to do is go heavy on the corrections and light on the affirmation. If we do that, it's almost a guarantee that eventually they will stop listening to us. And that's exactly what's happening in many relationships right now. In families, in friendships, in groups, especially after everything we've just gone through over the last two years. But by God's grace, things can change. The direction of relationships can change. Relational accounts can move out of the red and into the black. Ears can be opened. Bridges can be built into the lives of the people that we love. It can happen if we will be intentional about speaking gracious words that build others up. You may be thinking, okay, well, what about the people in my life who don't know the Lord? Like, how can I point out evidences of God's grace in them? 
Well, so glad you asked. I'm so glad you asked. Because, because if a human being who's made in the image of God reflects God's image in any way whatsoever, that's God's grace. That's called God's common grace. And it honors God and it encourages others when we point to it. Here's what John Murray said about common grace up on the screen and those who do not yet know the Lord. Look what he said. He says, he, that's God, grants them, that's people who don't know God, he grants them gifts, talents, and aptitudes. He stimulates them with interest and purpose to the practice of virtues, the pursuance of worthy tasks, and the cultivation of arts and sciences that occupy the time, activity, and energy of men, and that make for the benefit and civilization of the human race. Let me paraphrase John Murray here. He's saying, God is working in those who do not yet know him in ways that benefit society. And it glorifies God and encourages people to point to it, to say things like, I I thank God that he's given you the strength to work so hard. I know that's not easy. Or I believe that God has given you amazing creativity. It's really incredible to see. Or I thank God for you. I really appreciate the way that you care for your family. This is an integral part of my own story. I, as an, I, when I was a, an atheist, I married into a believing family. So my wife and I were not believers, and, and my father-in-law is a pastor. And, and so I, I can remember actually being in a, in a car with him one time, and, and he looked at me and he said, you know what? I'm so, I'm so like thankful that you married my daughter. And I was like, what? Like, it was the last thing I ever, I mean, it would be so easy for him to major on all the negatives. It'd be so easy for him to major on all the things I was doing wrong. I can remember sitting with him one time. He's like, I'm just so thankful for how, how hard you work to provide for my granddaughter. I was like, what? But here's what he was doing. He was building a relational bridge into my life. That's what he was doing. And guess what he did next? He brought the gospel over it. He built the relational bridge into my life, and then he brought the gospel over. One day he handed me this book called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. I had no intention of reading it, but he handed it to me over the bridge, so I took it. It ended up on my, my uh, table beside my bed. I had no intention of reading it. One night I couldn't sleep. It was like 11 o'clock at night. I saw that book there. I reached over. I opened it. Fast forward. It's now 3.30 in the morning. The scales fall off my eyes. I become absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ is exactly who he says he is. End up on my bathroom floor, repenting of my sin and giving my life to the Lord. And as we point to things that our unbelieving loved ones are doing right, the direction of relationships can change. Relational accounts can move out of the red into the black. Ears can be opened. Bridges can be built into the lives of those we love who do not yet know the Lord. And those bridges one day, by God's grace, may be used to deliver the truth of the gospel. The Puritan pastor, Richard Baxter, he put it this way up on the screen. He said, they love those who esteem them highest. The fault of these admirers can be extenuated and easily forgiven. If you would have his favor, let him hear that you have magnified him behind his back and that you honor him. That is so, so true. When people feel encouraged by you, they are way more likely to listen to you, which in turn may open a huge door for the gospel. So here's a question. Does this just mean that you never correct anyone? Like, is that what it means? Like, if, if, if you see someone and they're running toward the edge of the cliff, do you just kind of yell some encouragements as they go by and watch them sail off the edge? Of course not, right? Of course not. Uh, there are times we must correct. Love must correct, especially when someone's putting themselves or other people in danger. But at the same time, not everything requires correction. Not everything is a hill to die on. So how do we know when to correct and when not to? Well, pastor and seminary professor Ernest Beaver, he created this grid, which can be a very helpful tool when we're seeking to try to discern whether to correct or not to correct. So notice the two uh, up up on the screen. Notice the two different axes here, okay? So there's the importance of the issue. Then there's how sure I am that I'm right, okay? So let's say that something is not important and I don't even know if I'm right about it. So that would put us kind of at the bottom left, 
right? It's not important, and I don't even know if I'm right. So that's, that's not worth a correction. That's definitely not worth entering into a conflict over. Again, think of it the last two years. Okay, so let's say something is actually really important. It's really important, but I don't know if I'm right. It's really important, but I could totally be wrong about this. That would put us in the top left. So is that worth getting into a conflict about? No. Okay, well, let's say that I'm, I am totally right about this. I'm 100% sure I'm right, but it's not important. That would put us over at the bottom right. That's not worth getting into a conflict about. That's not worth correcting someone over. But what if what we're talking about here is really important? And what if I know I'm right? Well, then that's definitely worth a correction. That's even worth getting into a conflict about. So there is a time to correct, but not everything is a hill to die on. We need to be discerning, amen? We need to be discerning, which all comes back to this, that God has entrusted to you a tremendous power. Your words matter a lot. And now he's calling us, he's commanding us to use our words to build others up. So therefore, in light of the gospel, from a believing heart, let's worship the Lord by not letting corrupting talk come out of our mouths, but only what is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Amen? Let's pray. So Father, we're so, so very thankful for your word because your word informs us of who you are. Your word informs us of what you have done for us in the gospel. Your word informs us of, of what you've promised us both for today and for all of eternity. And your word also tells us how to live. And Lord, you're calling us to worship you in light of the gospel, in light of who you are, you're calling us to worship you, not only with song, but with our whole lives, including with the way that we speak. And so Lord, we, we pray now that you would move in our hearts and help us to take you seriously, to take your word seriously and to embrace this call to holiness through our speech. In Jesus' name.